pod. You, sir. I don't know. Plunky? Plunky? <laughs> Plonky? Plonky. Yeah, <laughs> I'm kind of glonky. <laughs> <laughs> Have you seen that video? No. It's like this street interview, and this guy just goes up to this oh, dude. Oh, dude, he's, yes. He's like, how are you doing? He's like, I'm going glonky. And he's just like, what? <laughs> yeah. Dude, that's a classic. Oh, my God. Oh, we're in? Yeah, if you guys want to. Perfect. Word. Well, okay. I will say there is no proper way to start this podcast. Maybe <clears throat> one day in the future, we'll have like a theme song. Yeah, a little jingle. And like maybe like each producer could like do like a remix. Like, that would be cool. That would be sick, right? I like that idea. It would be hard to like, with like timelines and whatnot, to be like, yo, dude, is that like... Uh, remix done or something so we gotta put a yeah. podcast out but but if it's only like what it'd be five ten seconds i feel like most producers could whip that up in an afternoon yeah like it would yours could be like more future bassy or something not trying to put you in a box <laughs> i'm just saying it could be probably, um, it probably would be it probably would be. probably yeah we would have to choose like a simple maybe like chord progression or something and then like mm-hmm. you could just like put that into different vsts we could send out the midi files like, yeah have a whole thing. Uh, we'll see. You could get a specific like <clears throat> jingle writer on the podcast, have them write the jingle. Podcast can be about that. And then after that, you have the producers remix it when they come on. Ooh. Because I'm sure that's, I know nothing about jingle writing, but I know there's writers who are specifically for jingles. So maybe that's something to dive into on an episode. Yeah, like a three note, like motif. Yeah. That's producer. Bro, we got to make that. We'll get it. I'm not promising anyone anything, but like... <laughs> I want that. The idea is out there. Yeah. Well, dude, thank you so much for coming over. I know, um, you know, it's been a long weekend. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> ready to go here? Yeah, yeah. Thank you for having me. I'm excited. Of course. I would like for you to just introduce yourself, if you would. Yeah. Hey, I'm Jay Willie, uh, or John. Um, I respond to both. But, um, yeah, so I am a producer and DJ. Um, I live here in Chicago. I've been here for going on five years now. That's a while. Um, I am a lifelong instrumentalist and musician. I play like nine different instruments. Um, as far as producing and DJing, it's mostly like melodic bass, melodic dubstep, future bass, yeah, something along those lines. But I also do like house, drum and bass. Um, I'm all over the place. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's a mixed bag. It is a mixed bag. Do you ever feel like you have big shoes to fill with having the same name as John Williams? <laughs> all the time um i i started going to college as a music education student and so i heard john williams jokes every single day um they don't get old though they're i I think it's funny i think one of these days i'm due for like remixing some of his music or something like a jurassic park theme yeah dubstep remix or something that could be kind of lit actually I'm here for you if you <laughs> if you need tips and tricks. I don't yeah, know. I like that. If I ever play like Lost Lands, then you know mm. I have I have a dinosaur themed song to play. That oh That'd my god, that's sick. All right, I'm adding that to like my list of goals. I have to do that someday. I feel like any of his scores would be bomb. You know, they would. He's he's so good. Um, although I will say, but for the longest time, and I think he still owns the title of like you know probably the best like score writer composer of our generation. But Hans Zimmer for me uh, yeah. is oh, I can't get enough of his stuff. He's more like modern sounding. Yeah, for sure. Like the, he does like those Batman like or like the Inception like. Yeah. <laughs> like, or Interstellar. What? Oh, my yeah. God. I love that. Love that score. Dude, I watched the Hans Zimmer masterclass and he's just like, I don't know, man. He's just so cool. He's so cool. And like he's so the guy. His positioning is just like. Yeah, I'm Hans Zimmer. You know? Yeah, like, he's so cool. Yeah, <laughs> he's got a sick name too, like Hans Zimmer. That just sounds cool. I know it is cool. Yeah, we got what we got though when we were born. Like you could change your name, but like, would you ever change your name? <laughs> when I was a kid, I thought John was such a basic name, and I I wanted to go by like Jack or something. I'm talking, I was like five or six years old, uh-huh. something like that. Um, but now I kind of like that. It's classic. I don't think I would ever change it. Yeah, my dad's name's John. It's a cl- my yeah. middle name's John. My dad's name is John, too. I'm John Williams II. I'm named after my dad. Ah, okay. Yeah. Gotcha, gotcha. Yeah. Cool. So, uh, based on that alone, no, I can't, I can't you change You can't my change name. it, no. yeah, because you gotta... <laughs> Sorry, Dad, I don't like your name. Like, no. <laughs> it's just, it's a classic, man. You yeah. can't go wrong. John. Right. Yeah. All right, cool. We, uh, 
<laughs> We've established the lore I guess of my that's, name. <laughs> yeah, I guess that's how we start. Um, word, man. Well, I have some some basic questions about... Uh, well, I got to start out with this basic question that I always do. Sure. And that is, what was your first concert? That I played in or that I attended? That you attended. It was Warp Tour 2013. Hell yeah. Yeah. That, I, I went to a few shows technically before that where I played, and it was like local Battle of the Bands at my high school, which is a whole other thing. But no, it was Warp Tour. Um, and so it, it was just such a cool experience. Like, I had never seen it was not only my first concert, but obviously festival. Um, and just yeah. seeing that many people that excited about music was like eye opening and life changing for me. Who was playing? I have a hard time remembering the first year. I remember a whole lot more about the, the year after. Um, <laughs> that first year. So, um, my friends and I, <laughs> we made edibles and it was my first time ever having an edible and making oh, them. Boy. Yeah. And I had no idea how any of that worked. And we, we made these firecrackers and we knew they took a while to kick in. So we eat them on the way to Warp Tour. And we went to Indianapolis cause, um, it was equidistant from where I'm from as Chicago it was a little cheaper, easier drive. And they started like kicking in right before we like get to the venue. We're like, oh my god, we gotta land this car. <laughs> oh my and god. but it was a great experience. I remember having a lot of fun, but uh, memories of that specific one. I just remember the the feeling and like the vibe of it. Um, but I loved it enough. I went back the next year. Oh, I remember sleeping with sirens. Um, that was like the most vivid memory I have from that first one. Mm. And Hawthorne Heights. I accidentally Ooh. saw Hawthorne Heights because they uh, it, it looks just like Tinley Park. Uh, it's the Klipsch Music Center. And so they had the amphitheater and they split it into two stages so bands could alternate. So there was no like layover time. And it was like middle of the day. It's summer. It's hot. We're like catching some shade, sitting down. And then I start hearing Ohio is for lovers. And I was like, wait, what the hell? Yeah. <laughs> is that Hawthorne Heights? And it was. And that was like one of the first CDs I got myself when I was a teenager, too. So that was a cool like little full circle moment. That was in rotation on my early, whatever, teens. Yeah. Teen era. Yeah. That's dope, man. I, uh, you also mentioned that you're like an, inst like, did you play in bands? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so like, yeah. Yeah. Um, so I learned guitar. I got my first guitar when I was 10 years old and I took some lessons, um, for like six months and then I was self-taught the rest of the time and, uh, one of my buddies lived right down the street from me. He played drums. He had a friend who played bass who was in another town. And so we'd all get together. We found another guitarist um, who was a little younger, but he could just absolutely shred. Mm -hmm. The kid was insane. And we, yeah, so I did like rhythm guitar and vocals. Um, and we didn't do a lot outside of like local stuff. It was my first band. Um we did like high school battle of the bands and stuff for a couple years in a row. Actually, I, it came up just the other day on my Facebook memories. It's been almost exact. It, it's been exactly ten years since we finally won battle of the bands. My last oh, year. Oh shit! Yep. You won. We won. We we got like crowd favorite a few times, and we got like third, and then second, I think, and then we finally won um, our last year. So, do you have tracks? from that era that are recorded? No, I still remember one of them. In fact, one of the first times I tried producing was I wanted to recreate the song because I, I wrote most of it and I can play guitar and bass and sing, uh, but I can't play drums. I was like, well, I've got GarageBand on my brother's MacBook, so I guess I'll try that. And I don't know, that file is probably floating somewhere on some hard drive. Um, but I still remember the whole song. And I've actually recently thought, like, what if I tried to revive those and, like, turn them into Jay Willie tracks? Yeah, that's what I was thinking, like a remix of some really old stuff. I mean, I feel like a lot of times it's best to just leave that stuff in, like, a box somewhere and mm -hmm. never think about it or touch it again. But who knows? There might be some sauce there. I think there is. And I actually, I had that thought about um, the first track I ever produced. I was a sophomore in high school. I didn't know anything about electronic music. I had just found like Scary Monsters and Nice Sprites and like, you know, Eyes on Fire, Zed's Dead remix. Like those were the yeah. first two big tracks. I think some Big Gigantic was in there. Um, mm. And then I found like UKF and I just went down the YouTube Dude. rabbit hole. And that's how I started. And I was like, I love dubstep. I want to make dubstep. I had no idea what dubstep really was. I knew like five songs. Um, yeah. But I made a song, made an alias put it up on YouTube, made it on my brother's MacBook on GarageBand. 
And I every couple of years, I remember that the track is out there. Um, it's not under Jay Willie. I'm not saying the name of it. You won't find oh, it. Oh, yeah. <laughs> actually, uh, maybe we could. Pull we could it up. sneak it in we somewhere. Could, like we could sneak threat? it. In. Is that a challenge? <laughs> <laughs> it's uh, it, honestly, if you could find it, I would be so damn impressed. I really would. Um, but no. So I I went back to it last year, and I you know some of it is just super cringe because I had no idea what I was doing. Yeah. Everyone's first track is, I think. But oh yeah, uh, there were parts of it I was like, wait, this is actually still a good musical idea. I could like pull this and like remake the song in some sort of way so i i i did that i actually rebuilt the midi for the main melody and i i still have it somewhere on my computer in ableton where like every once in a while i'll pull it up and i'll just see if i can like noodle around with it and make something from it someday it might come out maybe that's like the track when it's like you're you're ready yeah like that that's like when you know right you've put in those thousand hours yeah exactly or maybe do you ever use your vocals in your music or like guitars or you know, is, um, that, is that something you incorporate? Guitars, somewhat. Um, vocals, no, but I want to. Mm -hmm. um, quite frankly, I just haven't bought a mic and learned how to produce my own vocals. Like, I work with vocals all the time, obviously, but uh, they're from a professional vocalist who a lot of times has done a lot of the comping and basic processing to get it listenable. Mm -hmm. um, so I haven't yet, but I want to. As for guitar, I've done a little bit. I want to do more. Um, but the fact of the matter is I am not the best lead guitar player. I'm great with chords. I'm great with rhythms and all that. But um, I have designed a couple like synth leads that sound like guitars. And it's the tone I would want to get from a guitar. And I didn't realize how convincing it was until um, I did that for the first time on my track Recover. And some blogs covered it. Mm. And the all of the blog writers on like the four or five write ups all said like, oh, this punk pop guitar that he's playing. I'm like, that's a synth. Yeah. I, I'm outing myself right now. Wow. But <laughs> did you use like guitar rig or something no. like that? No, no, just serum and a bunch of post processing. And yeah, word. That's dope. It, it wasn't even my intention when I made it. It was just like I had a sound in mind and I got to it and I just thought it was a cool sound. And it turned out to be basically a lead guitar tone. One of my questions was you tweeted, I want to start playing metalcore and punk pop in my sets so bad. Yeah. Is that a reality that could happen? Oh, I, I think it's going to happen. Um, I think there's going to be a lot of legwork that I need to put in to get it to like to get it to flow in my sets the way that I like my sets to flow. Because, you know, I've been doing the style that I'm doing at this point long enough, put in the hours on it that it, I think it has a good flow. And I, I don't want to lose that. Yeah. Um, but I, I've been thinking about it for so long. And literally last night I was at Kazo, and Kazo is like notorious for working with like metal bands, rock bands. He had a guitarist and a drummer on stage with him. You know, he's throwing metal tracks in there left and right. And that like cemented it for me. I'm like, okay, like he sold, I think he almost sold out Radius. I'm like, Damn. this many people are about this fusion. I'm going to give it a shot. Wait, so you mentioned that Joyride played with Kazo. Was Kazo the headliner? Yeah. Damn, dude, he's doing like he's doing good. Man. He's doing really good. He's he's really carving his own lane. Yeah, we were talking about that like hard style switch up trap stuff. Yeah, mm -hmm. he's cool, man. He had yeah. this one track back in the day of like OG SoundCloud trap that wake up. I don't think I don't remember what it was called. It was like you know how like back in the day it was just everything was a collab. Yeah, <laughs> and it was just like oh dude they went in on something and it was I don't know man it was just. I would bet it, I would bet it's wake up. I, that was the first Kazo track I heard, and I think it was a collab with Riot. I think. Oh. I don't know, man. I just remember he made some heaters, mm -hmm. and it's good to see that he has like a, you know, like a life, like that he has grown and like, you know, yeah. kept in it. Because like I feel like trap was such a phase, and it's coming back. And anyway, big tangent there. Yeah. <laughs> no, um, I I feel that though. Like I trap is part of what got me into electronic music before I fully realized it. In fact, when I first started listening and w thinking about DJing, um, I was like, I called myself a trap DJ. Um, but I think I like this new wave of trap better, like kind of the, the Sable Valley style trap. Mm -hmm. I think that's more yeah. to my taste, but I don't, I don't play a lot of it anymore. That was just kind of like in the college days when I started. Yeah, for sure. No, I feel that. So like when you started DJing in college, mm -hmm. when did you decide like, oh, like this is something that I should be doing because like, how do I play my tracks for people? Like, that's what I was thinking at least. 
Yeah, so I guess to answer that question, I gotta kind of tell the story of it. So I started DJing before I produced. Even though I had been in bands and I had tried making a track or two, I didn't call myself a producer. I didn't really think about it. Um, what happened is, so I was a music ed student, like I said, and it got so intense that I started losing my love for music. You know, like mm. it was just, I was in 18 credit hours, but that was really like 30, I think I counted, it was like 36 class hours a week and then practicing because, you know, some of those classes yeah. were like three hour rehearsals with the full concert band or symphonic winds or whichever. Wow. Um, yeah, it was a lot. And I learned a lot from it and I'm very grateful for it. But I, I switched my major um, to sociology and psychology. And at that time, I also joined a fraternity and I got a random roommate um, who showed me electronic music for the first time. Um, and he showed me like flume and Weathen, and he knew of Weathen. I don't think they went to high school together, but they went to high school at the same time. He had friends who knew him. So I was listening to Weathen when he had like 3000 plays on SoundCloud. Um, and so I found that music. I just thought it was cool. Um, the Tennis Courts remix from Flume was like... Dude, that track? Yeah. I just remember them like talking about like how they rolled it out and like it was like Coachella was like the first time they ever played it. Mm -hmm. And that, that track is just so good, man. It, it's so good. And so then I just kind of went down the rabbit hole and um, fast forward to I was in a fraternity and I had a fraternity brother who had a whole DJ setup and he would occasionally DJ our parties, but otherwise I was playing music at parties and it literally just started with uh, someone asked like, who's got Spotify premium? Cause this is before like everyone had Spotify. It was like just coming onto the market uh -huh. and I had it and I had an old iPhone. So, you know, you can control it from like the other device. So I didn't have to be right there the whole time at a party. Yeah. So I was already DJing in a sense. And then I borrowed uh, my friend's equipment and I just kind of practiced just in my room and then we had a charity event um at our house and we needed music for it and it was like an outdoor thing and you know i was already the music guy i was like uh, i can dj kind of i'd never played for more than 20 minutes straight like, yeah. I, I had just learned and i played like this hour and a half set and i recorded it and people were like that was really cool like is did you record that did you put it out and i was like i mean i can and it i say blew up lightly uh, locally with like my friends in like their circles at college, but uh -huh. um, I think I'm finally getting around to answering your question. So <laughs> <laughs> um, it was just kind of a hobby and like, I just loved music that much. And then I started, I lived in the house. So, you know, we had parties and I would practice by playing the parties, you know, I, yeah. I more or less had a captive audience like four nights a week and that's where I cut my teeth. And then, so, you know, at that point it was just fun. And I started like loving the music more and more and more. And I started finding like Elenium right before he popped off. And like that sound to me was just mind blowing. Like I had never heard anything like that. Like the whole melodic bass thing, like Seven Lions, Midas, yeah, dude. all those guys. Um, and so then I started getting booked for like private events and then some of the bars around campus. And mm -hmm. then I started like really getting into my own sound, not just playing party music, but like, you know, crafting a mix. I started doing like a mix series, the loft sessions, which I kind of want to revive. Um, and that's how I really explored like my sound with DJing. Um, and yeah, from there, I think it just turned into like, I, I think the moment I knew like, Oh, I really want to make something of this is we had a formal up here in Chicago at HVAC and I got to open for it. And that was my first time like playing a venue venue. Um, and I was like, this is cool. And like, I keep growing and it keeps getting bigger and better. So like, I, I think I want to try and make something out of this. Yeah. HVAC is a cool venue. I like I, I've played there. I actually played that future bass set at HVAC. One really? Time. Yeah. I had a buddy that was like booking stuff there, but yeah, that was a fun venue. Yeah. Cool, man. Well, thank you for bringing us to that point where yeah. now we're here. I think like this would be a good time to listen to a track so people can get to know what some of these sounds sound like is there anything that you want to play in particular we got a couple tracks yeah so i think the one that's gonna show you know i've talked a lot about like the melodic bass sound that i would say is like my sound um we could do the one the remix i'm doing for kiefer and kai oh boy um <laughs> I, I know you're excited to hear this one the second drop is 
my sound. The first drop uh, <laughs> is techno, and I've never made techno before until this project. So if there's any techno purists out there, like, <laughs> don't kill me for this. But uh, this is my attempt at it. But yeah, we can play that. Oh my god, I'm stoked. We're gonna boost the master right here. Boost the master. <laughs> Let's go. Thank you. That's something I love doing in all my tracks. Yeah. It's very, like, magical. I love arpeggiators, too. Yeah. sound dude <laughs> fat and then the taser bass <laughs> That was sick. Woo! That was yeah. really sick, dude. Thank you. That was like very reminiscent of like old Porter, right? Yeah. Back in like the world's phase when like he was mm. doing his live shows. It's like a great mix of like melodic with really heavy kind of dancey bass. Yeah. That Thank you. Super cool, man. Thank you. Um, that is interesting that you say that. I've had people compare some of my sounds to Porter a number of times, and I love Porter. Yeah. I do not tolerate Porter slander. Um, but I, w I never would have called him one of my main influences. For sure. Not consciously, at least. But like I listened to his music, so I'm sure the influences made it in there somewhere. But I feel like that one specifically with that ARP and like the key, whatever, like it just sounded kind of portery. I know what you're saying. And then the wall of sound thing, too, for sure. Mm -hmm. But uh, I'll take it. <laughs> what I you said something taser bass and I've just never heard that but when you said it I was like yes yeah. I understand what you're saying is does that come from somewhere or is that like it's just a sound that I've heard and it's like I'll hear it in tracks and I just think it's cool but then I hear it at a festival 
on those huge mm -hmm. systems and it's just like just this fat aggressive bass but it sounds like getting electrocuted yeah, to like, me it's yeah. like fluttery yeah it sounds like in like if it's in a marvel movie and there's like an electrical something going on i don't know like it just sounds like the sound of an electrical zap yeah, yeah no i i, I totally understand what yeah. you're saying i feel like that's that remix of that track is really cool because i don't think anyone else is going to do it like that i agree and i that's what i try and do with my remixes is like take it in a totally different direction like pull a couple elements and like just run with it i'm curious just personally like how you normally make your chord stacks because like i know that those are fat they're actually not as fat as you would think it's the synth that makes them fat it's that and it's the spacing um mm. it, it's the voicing of the chord For so sure. it's really only like four notes but mm. they're just it's a lot of inverting and then just stretching it out and uh gotcha so that's a big part of it and that is just something i've learned from music theory um and without getting into like well, well sure we'll get in the, uh, into we the can science get into as much yeah. weed, <laughs> weeds as we want so know? what happens there and this happens in two phases let me finish answering the first part so it's it's the voicing and then it is like my synths which at this point i've like built a rack it's like six different serums and there's like all this shit happening in each one. I've got a processing chain I've figured out for it. Um, and between that and the voicing of the chord itself, you can cover a lot of the frequency ranges. Um, I don't know if I'm saying this right, but basically like I'll have like a saw and a sign and a square and you're getting all sorts yeah, of harmonics that harmonics, are covering yeah. this whole spectrum and then coupling that with the voicing and you do that a couple different times I think that's how I'm achieving that wall of sound. It's how I'm attempting to. I don't mm. know if there's a better way, but that's what I'm doing. No, that makes sense. You can get, like almost get different notes depending on like, especially if you're mixing up a bunch of different, uh, you know, waveforms because they have the different harmonics and whatnot. That makes sense. Yeah. That's cool. I like that like way of thinking because it's you start with something kind of basic mm -hmm. and then you just like build it off the synth work. Yeah. Cause like you could have so many notes if you really wanted, but yeah. yeah. I, and I used to do that. Like some of my earlier projects, there's like, I'm using half the scale in each chord and yeah. it kind of achieves the purpose, but, um, I'm learning simplicity is better. Cause then it frees up like while I'm covering all these like frequencies to get that wall of sound, I'm not actually taking up the whole space in the mix so I can have all the other, like the ear candy and the arpeggios and the leads mm -hmm. and the drums will still pop through. The other thing, that I love to do um, is using a lot of dissonance in my chord structures. And I learned this from um, Eric Whitaker's music and he's a choral composer. Um, and he does this thing called cloud chords. And it's like, I need to, honestly, I need to brush up on them, but he will literally have like three or four instances of dissonance within each chord. But the way he can voice it, it just, it sounds cohesive and it's not like, you know, awful on your ears. It's very beautiful. So I try and take mm. aspects of that. Um, and again, with that dissonance, you just kind of get some of those harmonics going where it's you're covering a whole gambit of sound. So it's like about like having like the space like, yeah, these two notes are going to kind of like rub against each other. But when they're not like the same or like right next to each other, it's not as dissonant. Right. At least to my ear and mm -hmm. it's it's funny i've done this in a way i had this one track it's uh where do we go which i dropped last september one of my favorite tracks that i've made and i th this whole like dissonance thing that i do in my chord structures is so like ingrained in my like process now that i don't even notice i do it and i would i was sending the track out for feedback to a few of my buddies and they're like this is out of key i'm like i promise you it's not and they're like it's out of key i i know it is and i i was like you know i I trust these guys and I value them as musicians. So I was like, all right. I, and I go dig through all the MIDI. I'm like, no, I swear to God, it's in key. And then I realized like, oh no, it's just dissonant. Like I'm, I'm breaking a cardinal rule of songwriting by like using the leading tone, the seventh or not the seventh, the, uh, yeah, the leading tone, um, as like a focal point in the lead in the drop, which is like mm -hmm. a, a sin, but it sounded cool to but me. But you so like it? I like it. Yeah. If it sounds good, it sounds good. So I went with it. Yeah. No, that's legit, man. I, I want to switch gears for a second here and talk. Cause first of all, we could talk all day. Yeah. But I want to switch gears to North Coast, man. Yeah. And just like, first of all, congratulations. Thank because you. Because that's fucking dope. I know from, I mean, just like my own personal thing. Like if I was playing North Coast, I'd be fucking hyped. I'd been yeah. going to that festival since I was a kid. And 
I know from some things you post on social media that that's also just a big achievement for you. So that's fucking dope. But I kind of wanted to talk about like, how do you get to that point? Like, how do you book North Coast? Yeah, so um, I, it's something I've had in mind for years. Like, ever since I went to my first festival, which was Lala, I, I just knew, like, I want to play a festival. And, you know, it didn't happen overnight. It It's kind of like I was telling the story of how I started earlier. It was fraternity basements and then private events and then bars. And then it, it was moving to Chicago and it was bars and then clubs and top 40 gigs. Um, and I think the turning point that put me on the path for North Coast was starting to produce my own tracks, play sets with my own tracks, and then shifting my sound entirely to like my sound. And so getting there, um, it, it was definitely, you know, it, it's all built on itself. And I started playing support for bigger shows like I opened for Arm and Hammer and Blank, um, supported E. Cali. Yeah. Um, you know, Flux. Flux Pavilion. Yeah. Um, yeah. He definitely does that flutter. Yep. He it, definitely does that flutter. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, and he was another huge inspiration starting off um, in that YouTube rabbit hole. You know, I can't stop and mm. all that. Um, yeah. But so I think part of it is, you know, I kind of built a resume and made a name for myself. And that happened kind of one brick at a time. Like every opportunity I got, I just took it very seriously and said, like, you know, this. I knew this wasn't the case, but I treated it like this might be the last time I ever perform. So I'm going to lay it all on the line and just give it everything I got. And like, you know, there's obviously a lot of people that do like melodic bass and all of that. You know, there's these huge artists that I base my sound off of that have huge followings. But in a city like Chicago, that's primarily a house city. Those opportunities aren't as numerous for like the genre that I say, I guess I would say is my main one. So mm -hmm. um I just made sure that every time I got on stage, I gave it my all and I was like, not everyone would love this, but you know, the people that will, will, and hopefully they stick along for the ride along the way. Yeah. And so it got me to a point where a lot of like my peers in the Chicago scene started playing North coast and you know, they'd go from like silent disco to like a small stage to a main stage and their, their time slots are rising. Yeah. And I kind of just looked at what they were doing and I would try and emulate that in my own way in terms like in terms of my career tra trajectory um so there was that to it and then part of it is honestly just a lot of the shows i played were shows for collective who books north coast so they knew mm -hmm. who i was and you know i'm i'm sure there were conversations behind closed doors that i'm not privy to where they're like all right well jay willie played the show and i think my first three shows at sound bar were all sold out um, nice. that's awesome. Thanks. And, uh, so, you know, I'm sure that makes it to somebody's desk who's making these decisions. And, you know, when the time came for it, I know that specifically for North coast, um, based on who they had booked on that stage, which I didn't know at the time, they just were looking for a specific sound, which I had, and my name got thrown into the conversation somewhere, somehow. And yeah, that's, that's pretty much how it happened. And then I found out it's for gigantic nightmare headlining. And I was like, those are two of my like favorite artists. My first electronic show was Nightmare. So really, yeah. And Big Gigantic was um, after that initial like discovering electronic music. They were one of the first groups that I like dove into. Like um, I forget the name of the album, but it's like black with like the blue and green ring in the mm -hmm. middle. That was like the first time I dug into an album of electronic music. And so playing a stage with them has always been a dream. And yeah. so when I found out that that was the headliner and that's why I got pulled in because I seemed like the right fit for it. Yeah. Um, that, that was just a really, really cool full circle moment. I, I want to make it clear that, you know, the music industry, I think like any other industry in the world is it's all about who, you know, but it is also what, you know, so like mm -hmm. the people that I think are pulling for me in these different parts of the scene, I've only met because I did the hard work to get in the room to shake their hand and, you know, however I present myself and whoever I am resonated with them. And, you know, so they believe in me and they have my back. Um, and so I, I, I would look at it this way. It's like, you know, if you have like I work a day job, I work a nine to five. Yeah. If I want a promotion, that's not going to happen just because I'm just at my desk doing my little doing the job doing my silly little emails like I have a relationship with the manager who's gonna put the word in with the director who's then going to base the recommendation from the manager on how they relate to the manager like interpersonally so you see what I'm saying like yeah that it's it's the hard work and it's the interpersonal connection so you know for sure um 
yeah, like that you've got Sherm who does a lot of the booking at Soundbar. He's given me a few of those opportunities. Um, and I only know Sherm because I was given an opportunity years ago where I was able to, able to meet Flanino and Maximo Quinone. So they're really tight with Sherm. You know, I go and support Flynn and Max at their stuff. I meet Sherm. He throws me a bone and I'm able to capitalize on the opportunity. So I think what happens... For sure. Yeah. That's a big part, actually. Yeah. Is it, the capitalization yes, it, of the moment. Yes. And that's that was the part I think I was trying to arrive at to make my point. Like, you know, I've had people throw me a bone, but I take that and I run with it. Um, yeah. And I've even been told by some of these people who have given me opportunities, they're like, yeah, like I give opportunities to people all the time, but there's only like you and like a few other people who really made something out of it. Yeah. So that's going back to what I said, like, I treat every opportunity like it's my last performance ever. And I lay it all on the line because I think some people take that opportunity and they might goof off with it. And then, excuse me, um, <laughs> <laughs> it's the beer. And, it's the beer. Uh, it's the beer. <laughs> and so, you know, they might just not take it seriously and then they don't get another opportunity. And I never want that to be me. I, if I fail at something, I want it to be after giving my 110%. Yeah. Because then, then I can say, regrets. yeah, then I can say I did what I could. If I if I give it my all and I fail at something, then I can sleep at night. But if I goof off and jerk around and that's why I don't succeed, um, that is something that I personally would have a hard time with. So, yeah, that's real, man. Yeah, that's real as fuck. I have some other questions. I wanted to go into X Medius. Sure. Because. I don't really know like the the full story behind that. Is this this is a collective? Is that what we would call it? Also, like it's a group. It's a collective slash record label. Okay, it started as a collective. So X Medius is uh, Peter's Abel Gray's idea. That's it's his brainchild, um, and then he came to me with it a couple years ago. Um, Flynn connected us because he knew we both made like future based melodic bass. He told me about X Medius. And so I guess I was like the first member after Peter founding it. And then we just, we had the idea, kind of like I was saying, Chicago's a house city. Um, there's a lot of politics <laughs> that uh, keep a lot of venues with kind of the same support and acts playing there. And yeah. I, I'm not going to knock anyone because a lot of these guys work very hard and they're very talented and they deserve those opportunities. But, yeah, you know, Peter and I saw a lot of the biggest venues in Chicago booking the same circles over and over and over for the same stuff over and over and over. And it was just all house related. And we said, you know, there's so many people that care about other kinds of music and that music deserves a way to shine. And we were both very aware that, um, it, it is all about kind of who, you know, and between him and myself and then everyone else that we've brought on board, like everyone's got their own talents and resources and connections. And we realized if we can pool that, yeah. we, can, we can make our own thing. And it was all with the mission of, you know, just shining a light on underexposed artists, very talented people who aren't getting a platform to showcase their talent. And we wanted to make sure that was possible. And so that's how it started. And then it, we kind of had the idea of like, you know, we, we, we had all these producers and DJs we knew mostly in Chicago and then it became national. We've got people all over the country that we've brought into this and you know, the idea was like, let's do some shows and, you know, do some takeovers. And we had a few of those happen and they, they went very well. And then we kind of said, let's make it a record label. It was an idea for maybe down the line. And we're like, now nah, we've got all these people with tracks who want to release them somehow or another. Yeah. Let's do a compilation album. And so that was last January and it went really well. Um, and since then, well, the compilation album was a way of saying like, hey, here's our roster. It was like the launch of X Medius. And yeah. then we realized like, well, we could just turn this into a record label. Because um, a lot of times, you know, great tracks will get looked over by labels or you'll be shopping them around for six months. And like one of my last releases, we shopped it for six months and then we got it signed and it was like over a year until it was coming out. And it's out now. Um, really? No Return, the last one that came out with Future Based Records. They're just so big and they had so much music. That was just their schedule. Yeah. And so... You know, the, the record label aspect of it is just something, again, we're we're picking up steam. People are taking notice. We're, they're finding out, like, who we are, what we're about. And now we have a way to help people release music where it's good music. They're talented artists. And now people will look to them um, because it's got a backing from X-Medius. How yeah. did you meet Abel Gray? 
Um, so that was uh, it was from Flynn. Just I don't know how Flynn knows him, but he Flynn is has been so influential in my career. Just in making shout sure, out Flynn. shout don't out know Flynn. You, but... I love Flynnino. I fucking love you, dude. Um, he has had my back from square one, and he has just he's invited me to shows, industry nights, made sure I've shook in the right hands, made sure I'm in the right rooms. Um, again, that's what I'm talking about. Like putting me in a position, giving me the opportunity that I then have to capitalize on. Um, I remember the first one was he was playing an industry night at Prism, and he invited me out, and I was a little nervous to go but i went and i had like just been in chicago for not long at all like maybe six months i think less like three or four and he was playing that night so he walks around introduces me to a handful of people who i now know pretty well but i didn't know anyone in the room and then he went to play and i was like oh i'm just kind of out here like solo roman like i gotta make the most of this and like i made some great friends that night and you know we're still connected to this day so in that same fashion, he was like, hey, you should look at Abel Gray. He makes music kind of like you do. I think you guys would get along. And he just kind of connected the dots. And then Peter and I hit it off. And we're like, wow, like I like your music. Like You're a cool dude. We hang out. Yeah. And yeah, it kind of took off from there. That's awesome, dude. Yeah. Very organic. Very organic. That's it's how I prefer to do things. Yeah. That's cool. So he's a Chicago guy. Uh, Abel Gray. Techni- he's in the Burbs, but yes, okay. he, he plays here in the city. And he had a history here before that I didn't even know about. He was in, I forget the name of the collective. Not, it, was it Good Looks? It was one of the collectives that um, I don't think they really operate as a collective anymore. I know most, if not all, of the artists are still doing their own things. But hmm. um, he was part of that. He played the mid. He had played Prism, I'm pretty sure you know all these clubs um and then he took i think he like took a step back to just kind of focus on producing more i I, i'm a little fuzzy on that part of the story but for sure no so he had some he had some knowledge and i was very active in the chicago scene at that point so we kind of again pulled our resources pulled our knowledge and then we're like wait we could make x media a very cool thing yeah i feel like certain things just like make sense it's like these two people have like done both the the skill raising like working on your craft and then also like knowing people and then you just like it's like a meeting of the minds and it just makes sense absolutely but you got to do the work yeah exactly i yeah yeah that you hit the nail on the head i um i think we should listen to another track sure and then you know in the effort to not go forever uh i'll ask you some wrap-up questions and then we'll uh we'll call it a day sure yeah what what do we want to listen to here your choice. Okay. Um, what did I load up? There's... <laughs> How many more tracks are, do you think we're going to listen to? I don't know. Okay. One or two? One or two. Okay. Yeah. We're Let's listen to one. So I've talked a lot about how I mainly do melodic bass, but I do a lot of other stuff, and I've been experimenting with a lot of other genres and sounds. Um, I, I want to go heavier because I play that in my set, so I want to start making that. So I've got this drum and bass track on there. It's called Ecstasy. Oh, baby. (laughs) I love this is the (laughs) wildest thing I've made so far, for sure. I'm so ready for it. I've been listening to a lot of drum and bass. A lot of liquid drum and bass. So this one, it started as a liquid track, and then it Mm. very quickly is not a liquid track. (laughs) (laughs) Turned into like a jump up track. It's I don't know what to call it. You can tell me, but you're gonna tickle my fancy with the drum and bass here though, I'll tell you that. I got you. Yeah, let's do it.
I'm sorry, what? Dude, that Skrillex squeal on there is just golden. It's just like I wasn't expecting it from this part to get into that. I know? wasn't either. When I was making it, I did not expect that either. Yeah. I was I was like, I'm gonna make some liquid. I'm feeling chill today. Yeah, and then we get that like screechy like yeah. <laughs> How do you keep those tame? Do you use like soothe or like you just make sure it's not too loud? Like Um, I don't use soothe. I just EQ. I just love soothe. Yeah. yeah I, I need to get it. I just surgically EQ everything and for sure. Just kinda I don't know. It's like you ever get in that zone like that flow state when you're producing and you're just it's like you black out and you're just like <laughs> you come out of it like an hour later you're like what the fuck did i just make how did i do that that's the best that's yeah. when you know you made something good yeah or you're like high and oh, yeah. you're like i did i don't know what this is oh yeah that I, could happen too that happens all the time i i smoke a lot when i produce and yeah i definitely <laughs> i i listen back to some of my music and i'm like how did i do that i really don't remember <laughs> sometimes it unlocks a door yeah sometimes yeah that was fucking wild. When does that, like when does that come out? Dude? Oh, I, like, I have no, no idea. idea. That's no why idea. we keep the whips here. Yep. That one I haven't even played that in a set yet. Yeah. Yeah. That one's that one's very fresh. But hell yeah. That that brings me to a point where I'm like, I I'm sitting on all this music and I I spent most of last year building like a a foundation of records that I could start shopping at bigger labels and I'm I'm really trying to decide like. I think I want to do that. I think like I have some dream labels. I'd love to be on like Ophelia, Heaven mm. Sent. Um, mm. I'm a huge Seven Lions guy and like yeah. Ophelia. I love their stuff. Love their shows. And you know I, I want to do that. It, it's a dream of mine to play on a lineup with Ophelia artists. And then at the same time, it's like I have all this music. I kind of just want to like put it out there. There are so many independent artists who like it's a it's more of a grind for sure, especially getting your music heard. But um, I love the idea of having complete ownership on it yeah. for the rest of my life. So I don't know that one. It, that's one where I like, I might take a really long time to shop it and like finish it, shop it, get it on a label. I think it deserves just sit on it as long as I need. Yeah. Or I might just wrap it up and be like, screw it. Here we go. What does shopping it look like? Is it emailing? It's, a, it's just a lot of emails. It's and it's like, email. if you've got someone who knows someone, they can like try and introduce you. So it's not a, a cold email, but yeah. Um, yeah, like for no return, you know, James and I, we were just sending out emails to labels all the time. And like, you know, we started with like, we started with like Ophelia and like, you know, our number one and two and three labels. And then you obviously got to give it time for them to listen and get back to you or not, because yeah. <laughs> that seems to happen a lot with labels. And then when you either get the no, or it's been long enough, you know, you, you kind of move down the list of what you want. Um, and then, yeah, eventually we found Future Base Records wanted to pick it up, which was cool because I listened yeah. to their stuff back in like 2014 when I first found electronic music. So another cool full circle moment. Yeah, for sure. That's awesome, dude. All right. Let's uh, let's hone this in. Also, I just wanted to take a quick. Does anybody have to pee? I'm all right. You chilling? All right, no, I, I can make it this then. I, I really, I don't have to be that bad, but it's like, I just want to make sure like Mace isn't over here like, bro, wrap this shit up. <laughs> Drinking like a gallon of water before we started. I know, yeah, dude. I got to stop doing that. I really, it's because of the, the hangover. Yeah, I've, I've drank a lot of water today and I think my body's just soaking it up like a sponge. <laughs> Your body's just like, <laughs> we still need more. Yeah, like this isn't enough, man. All right, so there's... One thing I wanted to just ask, and like, you know, you kind of alluded to it before, but I just wrote work, life, and then balance question mark. Like, yeah, how does one, you know, stay on the ball with working a nine to five job and then producing and like trying to wear like 40 hats and just like, how do you keep your momentum? It's tough to be honest. Yeah. Um, because, no, I, yeah. Because the work life balance isn't just work and life, right? Like there's also the social aspect. But of course, when you're in the music scene, 
lot of times that social aspect is work in a way. Um, yeah. You know, like I'll go to a show, but I'm also networking with, you know, other local artists that are there or promoters or if people recognize me, you know, I'm making connections with fans. And so like, you're signing like autographs. <laughs> I haven't done kiss, any autographs yet. Babies. <laughs> yep, yep, exactly. Um, but I, I think specifically with like the nine to five and then producing is like, I listen to music all day when I'm doing my work other than like phone calls, obviously. And so like, I'm always exploring new music. I listen to everything. I know some people say that, but I actually listen to everything. And so I will like, I, I, I'll just hone in on tracks that like really get me gassed up. Um, and you know, there are plenty of times where like, I'm not going to pretend that I'm like perfect and I go have like the best day at my day job and I'm like super productive and I go home and immediately sit down on my computer and crank out a tune. That's often not the case. Yeah. Um, I'll go on stretches without, this has been so weird for me in the past like eight to 10 months. I'll go on stretches of not opening Ableton for like two or three weeks. And then I will crank out a song in like a day mm -hmm. or less. Like the the remix of Boost the Master, three hours. Um, Walk in the Dark, that was eight hours. That was That's my record. Eight hours, start to finish, mix and master everything. Wow. Mm. That was crazy. And a week before that, I did Where Do We Go in like two days. And then mm. I, in that same time, I also made a house track that is still unreleased, um, which I don't have a whip of, unfortunately. I should have brought that. Um, I do have some house music that I'm sitting on. Come on, but I, man. It's Chicago. I know. What exactly. Doing, it's Chicago. <laughs> well, I think I have that one, and I have another house track that I've been sitting on for, like, almost three years now. And I think my thought is, like, I know that Chicago is so serious about their house music. And yeah. when I come to the table with my take on it, I want to come correct. And I want to come with a handful of records. So it's not like, oh, this future-based producer is trying to do house. You know? Right. You've got your every genre's got them. They've got their purists, um, but you know I do know the history of house music in Chicago. Um, I learned that when I learned how to produce. Um, I, I got to take a class in college where that was like the foundation. We started with how electronic music started. With it, it inevitably goes to the Chicago scene and the birth of house music. All that to say, I want to come correct with it. I think I strayed from the question originally there, but yeah. <laughs> I don't remember. It was just work-life balance. Yeah, yeah, it's just it's tough. I actually understand what you're saying, where it's like you'll not open Ableton for like days or yeah. like weeks, and then you just come in and like make something, and you're like, "Fuck." Yeah, but you, I'm sure there's a little bit of like, "Do I still got it?" <laughs> like, there is, and it's like, I, I have this internal battle where it's like, I do my best work when I'm inspired and in the flow state. But, you know, if every artist just went based on that, like, you wouldn't go anywhere if you only go with the inspiration. Like, you have to have discipline yeah, as well. For sure. Uh, which I need to get better about. Um, so that's... The, and a lot of times I'll open Ableton and I'll noodle around for an hour and nothing will come out of it. I'll get, like, a kick drum and a, a clap and that's it. Yeah, you'll, like, make some chords and be like... Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but I save all of those. Like, um... See the light that came out on the X Media's compilation last January. That was just a random idea from the summer before. And when we had the idea for the compilation, I just went through all my old projects and I found that. And I was like, oh, I'm better now. I know more now. Let's see if I can do something with it. Turned into a whole song in like three days. Yeah. It's just good to hear Keep somebody working. else. Yeah, exactly. Like, it's like that's like why I asked. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Like the the boost. Keep the on keeping on. <laughs> yeah, the boost the master remix. That's the first thing I made since Ecstasy which I made uh -huh. in October, like Word. the day before the Flux Pavilion show. So that that is, it was four months. Mm. That's my longest stretch. Yeah. Um, granted, I had my own like personal, like mental health shit I was trying to navigate, which, For you know, sure. a lot of times I think is a great inspiration and or like producing can be, my producing can be super inspired by the stuff going on in my life and like mental health and just all of that. Um, and, Oh, there was a second point I was going to make there. It's being mind. sad or something. Yeah, being, like, yeah. I was just going to, I was, when you were saying that, I was thinking like, sometimes I make good music being sad and then sometimes I make nothing yeah, being sad. I that's just, exactly what it is. Like some of my best tracks I made, well, I was very sad. But what's weird is I will, this has shifted recently, but originally I was making super happy music when I was super sad and super sad music when I was super happy. It, which really? Is, yeah. Which is kind of ass backwards, but that's how it came out. You're trying to like balance yourself out. I guess, yeah. But I, I love sad music, even when I'm in a good mood. I, I it's just so beautiful. Well, because it's like real as fuck. Yeah, like, exactly. Yeah, dude. yeah, yeah, yeah. Thanks for shedding some light on that. Because sure. I know a lot of people. You know, no one's just like 
oh, I only make music and that's all I have to do and it's a dream. <laughs> like, you know it, what I mean? Yeah. It's just not like that. It's just not. Like, I play video games, I hang out with my friends. Yeah. Like, I have, there's so much more to life. And yeah. it, I, I think it's because I had that time where I got burnt out on music that I just really make sure I give myself the space to breathe and just be a person so I don't get burnt out on it again. For sure. I feel that. Well, that brings me to my, my wrap up question. Cool. Um, alluding back to the first, one of the first questions I asked you, you know, I asked you what was your favorite, or I'm sorry, what was your first concert? I'm about to ask you, what is your favorite concert? And it could be one that you've played, it could be one that you've gone to, but just some experience that you were like, this is some next level, whatever. You yeah. could also have two. I have three. Okay. Uh, <laughs> favorite. I think the favorite show that I've been to, it was either, I think it was Seven Lions at, on the Alchemy Tour. Uh, he had Good Vibrations open, and I'm a oh, yeah. diehard Nightmare and Slander fan. Yeah. Fun fact, I saw the first ever Good Vibrations at my first electronic show. It was a nightmare show at Canopy Club at U of I, and he brought Slander down, I think from Chicago, for a surprise set. And when they announced the Good Vibrations tour a year later, they said that that was the test run. Oh, okay. So I was at that show too. You were there. That's that, wild. Yeah, I was oh, there. Yeah. No way. Really? I was on a concert tour that weekend. Yeah, we did Indy, Bloomington, Champaign, and then up in Chicago. Yeah. Wow, small world. It was yeah. a crazy show. Yeah, it was fun. I, I didn't even know I liked dubstep that much at that time. I went to hear the Limelight remix, and then oh. he played, then he played a dubstep set, and I was like, "Yo, this is crazy." Mm -hmm. um, but so I, it was cool because I saw them, and then that was my first time. It's not. I saw Seven Lions at Spring Awakening, but it wasn't. It didn't stick. But I remember turning to my friend, and it was ten minutes into the Seven Lions set, and he'd played every song I knew by him. Mm. And I was like, "Wait, he played all the bangers. What's he gonna do next?" And then he played Trance for like forty minutes, mm. and I was like, "What the hell?" And it, it was my first time seeing Trance live, and it just it was so sick. Um, favorite show I think I've played. It, supporting Arm and Hammer and Blank was insane. First mm. time playing Concord, but it was uh, this past summer. I wow. opened for Snake Hips, and I don't know what it was, but you know when you're DJing and you're just in the pocket, like you're just you're just locked in with the mm. crowd. I had a three hour opening set, longest set I've ever played for a crowd, like other than like a private event. It's a long, yeah. It was long, and it was my first time doing a house set as Jay Willie, mm. and like a proper one in Chicago for a sold out crowd. So I was scared shitless. Um, but I don't know what it was. The energy in that room was absolutely electric and I just, it just all flowed and I was just in the pocket. I loved it. I had people DMing me afterwards. They're like, you just played better than snake hips, which like wasn't my goal, but like, you know, <laughs> you outdid the headliner. <laughs> <laughs> Look, re respect to all headliners, but like, I'm going to show up and I'm going to give my best set. I'm not yeah. gonna, I'm not going to tone my stuff down. I mean, I'm not going to go out there and play like all their tracks or yeah, something. Like like, I, yeah, like I I'm going to follow the etiquette and I'm not going to play like tear out dubstep at 9 p.m. <laughs> unless that's what the show calls for, but right. um yeah, that one was just crazy, crazy fun. The energy was insane. Um I wish I had recorded it, then I didn't, sadly. Um but then the third one is Knock 2 this past weekend. I have never seen a crowd go that crazy. Um, I didn't know it was going to be a 360 setup. That was my first time going to one of those. And yeah. my buddy and I, we've gone to a lot of shows together. And we just like, there were moments we just stood there and looked around. We're like, what is happening right now? Like mm. everyone was jumping the whole time. It was crazy. Really? Yeah. It was, the energy was insanity. Damn. One of the best. Yeah. And like, I like Knock too. I respect a lot of his music. I wouldn't say I was like dying to go you see You weren't him. expecting that. Yeah. I, I went to go support. Uh, Flanino was opening. I got to support the boy. And I was just kind of itching for a house show. I was like, yeah, let's go. And it was just off the fucking hook. Yeah. It was crazy. That's dope. Yeah. The 360 shows are always special. Yeah. It felt just very like intimate. Fred again, just like, yep. <laughs> plays rumble again. Just, just wheeling like, it back. Fortet just chopping in a rhythm <laughs> track. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> but yeah, no, I'm, I, okay, this brings something else up. You also, I saw one of your tweets, because I do a little digging. Mm -hmm. And uh, I saw that you secured the bag on the boiler room ticket. I did, which is sick. I'm yes. I want to go so bad. I don't know how I'm going to try to like weasel my way into that, but uh, I'm sure that that will be like the, the boiler rooms. Like always, like surrounding yeah 
the artist. So yeah, I and that's think gonna be at Radius, right? Yes, I'm very so excited cool. to see that. They haven't even announced like artists, right? It's they just did. Like, they just announced oh, they them, which I actually I personally don't know a lot of the names, um, but I'm I'm going mostly because like. I'll admit, I got onto. I knew what Boiler Room was before the Fred again set, but of course that got me really hyped about it. For sure. And then Kiefer's birthday is like the day after. He's like, "I'm going for my birthday." I'm like, "Yeah, I'll go celebrate your birthday with Shout you." Shout out Kiefer. Shout Ian. out Kiefer. Boost that master. <laughs> um, but yeah, so I was like, "Sure, I'll go." I'm always down for a show, especially Radius. I love Radius, especially yeah. at 360. Radius is sick. Yeah. It's it's my favorite venue. I fa favorite large venue. It's, I mean, it's astronomically expensive. I always say that, but yeah. it's just like it's such a cool. It's a warehouse. You it know? is. After two nights there this weekend, I haven't checked my bank account yet. I'm oh, scared boy. too. <laughs> yeah. 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 Uh, Cause you know, it's like after that first drink hits, I was like, I'm buying you a drink. I'm buying you a drink. I start running into friends. I'm like, I'm getting you a drink. And mm -hmm. then and suddenly I'm like, this isn't a dive bar. These aren't $6 <laughs> Miller lights. <laughs> you know. Word man. Well, I feel like, uh, you know, first of all, I just want to say thank you. Thank you for having me. Thank you for coming. It's my I first podcast experience and it's been a blast. Let's fucking go. Yeah. <laughs> Hell yeah. I think we like run a track. We we should rent yeah, something on and one. then. Yeah. Uh, All right, I will let what, you pick. Uh, there's ooh. two left, so there's one. What are the vibes? Um, dubstep or melodic dubstep. One of them is my collab with Mamba, and we've only played it once when we opened for Flux Pavilion with our B2B. Um, another track I've only ever played twice, um, and it's an Iron Man remix. And I only oh. play on Halloween because I dressed up as Iron Man. I fucking love Iron Man. I have like the arc reactor. I shave my beard into really? the Tony Stark. Yeah. And so I I did it because um, Yuki, they did it first. Not this past Halloween, but 2021. They posted a clip of them playing it at Red Rocks like a week before Halloween. I already knew I was going to be Tony. Um, and they didn't drop the song. I was like, okay, fuck it. I'll just, I'll make my own, I guess. Um, and then... I, I just got it playable for the show and it went off. It was cool. And then uh, this past Halloween, I like souped it up because I got better at producing uh -huh. and I was Tony again. And then they dropped. I was like, oh, I'll drop it on Halloween or like on the day that I play the show as Tony Stark. And they dropped it the day before. And I was like, fuck. Oh, no. So like I'm going to hold on to it. I'll put it out eventually, but I might wait a while because I, you know, I'm not trying to ride their coattails. They did a cool version of it, but, you know, I want mine to be my own and not look like I just kind of tried to rip them off or something for sure so do you want to hear sure. i think we need to hear that one i think iron man one all right need yeah. to hear that one i think the version that i included on there is the show intro version so there's like a lead up to it okay which is worth playing nice yes let's get it it's gonna be theatrical it is i'm hoping it, it is it's it's uh i used a lot of samples from like a theatrical like cinematic score sample pack to start it Feeling the Marvel coming in, like, yep. Transformers. <laughs> yeah, literally Transformers noises. when I play this and I get on stage, the arc reactor is off, so I can press it to turn it off. And you'll know the moment where I turn it on and the crowd is like, whoa! Dude, hell yeah.
sick. This is smacking. It gets better. <laughs> this next drop, I made the day of the Halloween show. Uh huh. And I was just like fucking around. I was like, oh no, I'm keeping this. This is fire. We need this, yeah. Like shit post, but make it good. <laughs> Dude, this is. You gotta release this, man. Love it, dude. Thank You're you. All, it's like always like a two genre song. Not always, but like mostly, usually, lately. Yeah. yeah. Hell yeah. I really liked that. Uh, I mean, both drops were great, but that dubstep drop, dude, like that constant LFO, like going yeah. baseline is mm -hmm. just something I've been missing from dubstep. I feel like that disappeared like six or seven years ago. Yeah. Like, it, and it just kind of turned into rhythm which is cool it's its own what? thing what? yeah yeah and, and you use the uh like the screams pretty effectively too but like mm -hmm. just that constant like almost old school bass nectar kind of sound dude like super mm -hmm. cool yeah super i cool. i do yeah. i do miss that like i love i hate the name bro step but i do love the sound of it and i think that's where that og like you said that lfo yeah. baseline kind of disappeared a bit so yeah that was in my mind that was like it just fit the vibe it was kind of like a, a homage to the stuff that got me into it initially like again back to those ukf days and all that so yeah i'm glad you guys like it i feel like it's just a classic remix like that is it's just you gotta somehow or you could keep it as just a track that you play live too. that's that kind of be the thing too i i want to put it out i think it'd be a fun way to kind of just be like okay like a lot of my music is like very emotional and like kind of serious and like i like that um about like what i make but this would be a fun one to be like boop iron man yeah. Um, but I also, I do love that. Like I only play on a Halloween right uh -huh. now. I, maybe that'll change, but right now it's only a Halloween song when I'm dressed as Iron Man. So yeah, we'll see if that changes. It's it might. fitting. Yeah. Um, if you guys yeah. like it and you want it to come out, let me know, but <laughs> yeah, we'll make like a poll or something. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> do something. All right. Well, uh, yeah, that's it. <laughs> that's all she wrote. I don't know what else to say. Oh, yeah, no, wait, actually, hold on. Oh, okay, never mind. <laughs> Where can people find you? Uh, you can find me all over the place. I got, I'm most active on TikTok. I just type dumb shit on Twitter. You got some funny videos on TikTok. Yep. Re um, relatable. I, I try it, like, it's it's such the game. Like, you got to do social media content. So I try and make it fun. I'm not doing TikTok dances or anything, but, you know, yeah. I try and keep it music related. Or, like, the other night... Um, they they drop the high noon tequila seltzers and like oh yeah i saw that yeah i, I love tequila i love trying Me new too. seltzers i swear to god the mariano's next to my apartment is like a test market because they have everything the day it drops and i got those the day it dropped and all everyone on like my snapchat and instagram stories were like oh how are they i'm like fuck it i'm just gonna do a review video um i'm not turning into a, a <laughs> seltzer reviewer but i might do more of those they were kind of fun but yeah. um yeah tiktok i i post on there more frequently now instagram Instagram is my most active one. Um, I have a Facebook page that honestly is kind of neglected, but um, yeah, that, that's typical. Yeah, <laughs> and then uh, I shit post on Twitter, and then Spotify, Apple Music, SoundCloud. Excuse me again. Oh my god, <laughs> that's why we the beers are a risky uh, yeah <laughs> thing. But you know, we had to. What do you call it? Uh, Hair of the dog. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I needed it. Um, but yeah, I have. I have the most music on SoundCloud. I have mixes, sure. like mix series, like unofficial remixes, bootlegs, mashups. Um, but yeah, you can find all, me all over the place. All J. Willie. All J. Willie, yeah. Okay. Uh, I think technically, so the first song I put out was a remix of Alone by Marshmallow. I took a production class in college on Ableton, and the final project was a full song. And I... I thought the Alone song was cool. I liked OG Marshmallow. Yeah. But he did a remix contest so I could find the actual vocal stem. Mm. So that's why it became that. And that came out, uh, I briefly, <laughs> uh, the people who knew me at that time, I, I went by Lotus for a little while because I just, mm. I thought Jay Willie, I was like, Interesting. I was like, I want an alias. I want a cool like artist persona that's separate from me. Yeah. Um, and then I was like out at the bars one day and someone was like, hey, Lotus. I was like, Ugh, don't do that. 
I don't like that. And they said it seems like they said it kind of condescending. It kind of well, and I, th- I think that's because like Jay Willie came about as like that was a nickname before I was a DJ. Mm. Um, in my fraternity, there were four Johns in my pledge class, so they had to call everyone something to keep us separate, and I just was Jay Willie. Mm. And then I started DJing, and then it stuck. Um, and I think that's why I tried to very briefly for like a month or two tried to rebrand um, because I was like, well, I didn't pick the name. Like, mm-hmm. I, I want to pick my thing um but at this point you know jay willie is who i am so i th- i am iron man i am jay willie <laughs> um, i mean the name is like not that like skrillex isn't that just like a random i don't know what that is aim name or something Some- he chose and then he was like well i guess i gotta stick with that yeah so yeah i've just i've learned to own it but anyway point being that song i think the album art still says lotus but it now says jay willie Oh, okay. Yeah. So are we going to find some Lotus uh, on YouTube? Some old dubstep garage band Lotus? No, that's not the name. That's, that's not, oh, that's not name. the name. No. We will have to talk about that off pot. That's like yeah. a Patreon exclusive if we ever do that. <laughs> like your your original Let, let me moniker. say this. You you said... Can we like yeah, give like some breadcrumbs? Or something? Yeah, you said a word earlier. You were talking about like a moment or a song or a show or something. And you described it in a way that was the track name. Okay. All right. I'm gonna have to go back. We'll do a and listen dig. back. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I will say the the artist name is not John or Jay Willie, and it's a made up word. So good luck. <laughs> okay. I love this. But if you can find <laughs> it, if you can find it, like, yo, we'll, if you can find it, we will. I will give you any. If anyone can find this track independently, and you're the first person, I will give you a Jay Willie hat. I'm dead serious. Oh fuck yeah! Let's yo, go. we gotta get Nardwar on this, dude. <laughs> yeah, I bet he could figure it out. Yeah, he would find it. Yeah, he would find it, and it would be scary. He'd be like. It's not good. I'll tell you that much. There's like a there's it's like good up until a point. It's not supposed to be. It's endearing. Yeah, that's what our first tracks were. were I do occasionally go listen to it and then listen to like the song I just made or put out like to compare. Like okay, I did get better. Like I did improve. Yeah, Yeah. I'm not still there. Yeah, yeah. Thank God. (laughs) (laughs) Word. Well, I love it. I'm all about the like little secret Easter egg hunt. Yeah. Um, Thank Thank you for that. You're welcome. Um, and thank you guys for listening. Um, we'll see you another time. <laughs> yep. Thank you guys so much. Thank you for having me. Of course. Thank you guys for listening. Um, go listen to some Jay Willie tunes. Come catch me at a show. Let's go. See yeah, you at North Coast. in Chicago, say what's up. Yeah. Peace. Peace. Peace.